last week, we covered our, our Resurrection Sunday message. I hope that, guys, that message touched you or blessed you. Or maybe you had a chance to think about that. Y'all remember we talked about Resurrection Sunday. We, we really hammered on the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember that story about where Peter kind of reacts violently with a sword. The, the disciples basically forsake Jesus. And then Peter denies Christ. Y'all remember that? And I talked about how in Psalm 22, we saw that not only do these guys suffer, Jesus suffers most of all with a very famous phrase, Psalm 22, remember that? He said, verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken? And that was just as much prophecy as all the other Psalms. Psalm 2, you know, uh, the, why do the nations rage against the Lord and his Christ, his anointed? You know, the Lord will laugh at them in derision. Or Psalm 110, it says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit here at my footstool, I mean, my right hand, until I make your enemies your footstool. There are these things. So we learned a lot about what it means to go through a trial, what it means to persevere, and we learned how Jesus, in all fairness, overcame what I consider the biggest trial that will ever happen in this universe. I know some of us have some hard times, but I'm going to just lovingly say, no one has suffered the way Jesus did, but yet he overcame it and showed us how to overcome. And in doing so, Philippians 2 said he was given what? The name above every name, whether in heaven, on earth, or under the earth, that in the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Why did I say that? Because some of us still carry some things that are dying or dead. And until we get through that, we will not see a resurrection of our biggest dreams and hopes. And that's why I was saying it was a tough message because... We want to pretend like everything's well, but Jesus was willing to admit Psalm 22 is just as much scripture as the rest of the Bible. He doesn't hide that from you. But yet he overcame it by saying what? Our fathers trusted in you and you answered them. Do you remember these things? So please, I'm not trying to recover the whole scripture. I always want these messages to be fresh in your mind. Because friends, I'll be honest, the Bible's a daily thing. It's not like, hey, we heard that sermon last week. I know that, God forbid, some of us hit a trial. Or maybe I hit a trial. I begin to ask God what's going on. That's why we need these things fresh in our mind. So is that okay? I just wanted to just kind of live in your mind. I want you to get familiar with Scripture. I want you to be like, you know what? I know exactly what we're doing together as a family. Because before that, we've been really picking up a series about the life of Jesus Christ. Does anybody kind of remember that? We talked about spiritual growth, spiritual depth and his spiritual power. We were talking about the life of Jesus. Let me give you a hint. Nicodemus in John chapter 3. This is weeks ago, I understand my people, I remember. I just want to get everybody on the same page. Nicodemus looks at Jesus and says, what, like, how, who are you? We know God's with you, but what is going on? You have something none of us don't. None of us have. None of us have what you're doing. You're doing things people have never heard of. Like, we'd like to know. And you remember Jesus answers them with a very simple question. Answer, you must be born again. So in a sense, you tell them, you got to kind of start over. And as a church, I'm not saying y'all don't know anything. I'm just saying, let's just start over the way Jesus started. Let's just kind of drop all our pretense and all our supposed crowns and acclaims. And let's just pick it up where Jesus started. And the first thing we saw is we must grow. And we saw the power of increase. Is it kind of jogging your mind to 1 Corinthians 6. We saw the power of increase. And then we saw his baptism, and that Jesus was filled with the Spirit. Luke 4, 1. What was that Spirit? Isaiah 11, 1 2. The seven spirits of God. Now here's your turn. I'm not asking you to do it publicly, but do y'all remember the seven spirits of God yet? Can you name all seven? If you cannot, if you can't actually praise God, if you cannot, please, please, let's come to a point where we take personal responsibility and learn to know these things without Michael, or just without, you know, your Bible that we can go. Let's make it here. I think it's worth it. I mean, I can tell you all about Akim Olajuwon, but I can't tell you the seven spirits. That's not good. Let's be a man of God, a woman of God. So we learn about spiritual depth, and then we roll into spiritual power, how Jesus was anointed with both the Holy Spirit and power. And then Luke 24, Jesus said, do what? Tarry in Jerusalem until you are endued with power, from on high, which meant they were clothed with power. People are like, oh, no one can be like the apostles. Okay, I'm not Peter, but I'm Michael. Man, you're you. 
God told you the same thing. We should all be powered up for our ministry, for our calling. And some of us have dipped, you know, driven out in the battle without these things, and then we get punched in the face. You're like, oh man, you know, God, you're not, you're not working with me. He's like, no, why don't you stick to the formula? I think some of us have those stories too. Why am I saying all this? I'm not trying to flood your mind. But do you remember I said the seven spirits thing? I said as a church, we were going to dive into it. Do you remember that? Because that was complicated. And I admit, I don't think that was an ordinary topic to say, what are the seven spirits of God? And why are they seven? Isn't there only one Holy Spirit? And I said as a church, we would dive in further. So I'm not saying you guys have to be an expert. I'm just saying as a church, let's, let's talk about it, right? Let's talk. I think it's worth talking about. Because I feel like these are things that would be new and fresh to us as a family of God. And I believe that Jesus had all seven and wanted you to have it. Whereas in the Old Testament, when the Spirit of God came on somebody, I believe that it only manifested in one piece or another. I'm going to show you and prove it tonight. So are you all ready? Is everybody kind of warmed up? I know it's been several weeks, and I had the love to doing this during the week, and so do you. But you have your own studies. Let's, uh, let's make this one joint effort. Friends, to do that, to really study the seven spirits of God, we're going to go into a book that I believe is one of the most complex books in the Bible. And I'm not trying to trump up anything like this. I believe that anybody, when they hear the name of this book, they would say, yeah, that's a complicated book. But I believe it will give us the answers that you and I are probably looking for if you have a hunger to serve Jesus in a very radical way. Why do I say that? There's one book called Revelations. And many of us treat it as a book of the end times or the end times prophecy. But friends, may I tell you something? All of us have been given some kind of revelation of God. When a book says it's the revelation from God, it sets a standard that I don't think any of us have ever seen. Now, that might have confused you. Well, I'll explain. Who wrote the book of Revelations? John, right? He wrote it. Now, let's go to Revelations 1, verse 1. Do you mind? I'll go slow. Don't we're all going to get this. If I'm flooding you, don't worry. We're going to do this together. Revelations 1, verse 1. Now, everybody knows that John wrote this book. Absolutely, he wrote the book. But I just want to bring your attention to the very first verse because this book is as complicated as it gets. Please read with me, Revelation 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, meaning us. God gave a revelation to show us things which may shortly take place. And he sent and signified by his angel to his servant, John. So let's just, let's stop there. Just a moment. I'm not going to call anybody in. John is the author of this book. But did John have anything really to do with this understanding? Kind of. In all fairness, Paul's epistles, right? Paul wrote letters to churches. Now, I don't know if he knew that was going to be the Bible or not, but he wrote a letter to Corinth, two of them. He wrote to Ephesus and, and uh, Galatia and Thessalonica. You remember these? Those are epistles. But this book is extremely unique. Why? Because all he's about to do is document what God's about to say. Did y'all can it? Good. Now, it's not just God talking. It uses a very unique word. Revelation. Now, if you don't understand that word, I'm going to explain it to you. But it's not a small deal. What do I mean by revelation? What is a revelation? In all fairness, what's a revelation? Let me water it down. It's when God gives you something that you now understand that you never understood before. That's a revelation. When someone can in ministry, I know people use that talk in, in business and other circles. But when we talk about ministry and the people of God, and we talk about what is a revelation, it's when God almost downloads an understanding of you that you didn't know. And you don't even know how you know it other than God gave it. So that's my parents. Now, if I'm just going to be a little bit personal, people ask me, and I share this privately with people when I'm teaching on other situations, I, I tell people I preach by revelation primarily. I'm not one to really study books. I'm not one to just kind of read authors. I'm not against that. That they study books and they, they culminate a lot of information and they begin to share the insight that they learn. I preach by revelation, meaning I sit alone with God and I pray till God literally gives me things I frankly don't know. I'm, I'm just being transparent. So when I say a man can have revelation, that's good. But I'm going to show you how small I am when the Bible says, read this first verse again. The revelation of whom? God in the person of Jesus Christ. So if God is about to give you his revelation, 
Things that he's going to tell you that are so beyond you. I hope you give a different perspective of this book. See, too often you hear the book of Revelation, you say, yeah, that's the end time, and that's when the devil shows up, and that's the end of the world, and we get to hear about heaven. Yeah, yeah, true. But free, please, friends, Revelation is actually a very detailed book, and we're just stuck in the first verse. I want you to understand, when the Bible says this is the massive undertaking as if Christ were to reveal to you the fullness of the Spirit, that's what we're about to undertake. Does everybody kind of understand me now? It's not just John's letter to you. John is going to write, if Jesus says, hey Jesus, give me your maximum understanding. Give me your revelation. Things that no one knew before, you're going to teach me. Everybody okay with that? I'm going to hammer that home some more, but let's get that framework started. So it says this, the revelation of Jesus. Yes, John wrote, but we're about to hear if God were to stand at a platform and say, I'm going to preach not from a book, I'm going to preach out of the Spirit. That's this verse. Now that's what makes this book so unique. You know, that's not a normal book. I'm not trying to elevate one over another. I just want to show you that this book is very different than a traditional Bible story. Now, if you're okay with that, Let's continue. Now, let me show you just a little bit more about Revelation. You say, Michael, okay, what does Revelation mean? That's okay. Would you mind jumping with me to 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16? We all have been given Revelation, okay? I don't want you to feel like, oh, what, what's the deal here? Is that only me or you? 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16 says this. Actually, I have the wrong verse. It says this. Uh, go to 2 Corinthians 3, verse 16. My apologies. It's actually 2 Corinthians 3, verse 16. It says, nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 16. If you don't want to just write your notes, you'll have it up fixed in a minute. 2 Corinthians 3 says, when you come to Jesus, the veil of knowing God is what? Removed. What is a veil? Have you ever been, seen like a new car show? What do they do with a brand new car when it's about to be revealed? They keep a curtain on, a veil. And they play the music, flash the lights, they pull the veil. The Bible says that you received revelation when you came to Jesus. Is that okay with you? What I'm showing you is that this book and you are about to collide. I just want to prepare a people of God to receive the revelation of Jesus. Not Bible. Not, forget me. I'm just going to be a mouth here. We're going to look at God talking. But how does somebody connect to God? What, how am I going to understand God's thoughts? The first thing I'm going to show you is when you came to Jesus, God pulls the cloak. No more tricks. No more hiding from you. One more. He's saying, well, how do I do that? 1 Corinthians 2, verse 12. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 12 tells me, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Did you have to pay for the book of Revelations? And Jesus did. I believe he paid for all of us. But it's been given to us freely. So these two verses are going to help collide, or connect, if you will, with what we're going to study in Revelations. Now you might say, Michael, that's a lot of detour. I had to detour because many people read Revelation and say, oh, you can't get that book. That's confusing. Or that's a lot of enigmas and parables and, and analogies that are not for people. May I tell you, friendly, in Revelation 1 it says it's given for us to understand. The book's not given to four people so they can just stand on this corner. It's for all of us. But we must understand how God prepared us for it. So if you don't mind, just for a minute, we're going to continue this study. We're about to open the book of Revelations. But would you just mind asking the Holy Spirit, give me a deeper understanding of you, Jesus? Would you mind just, just in your own heart, your own thoughts, Holy Spirit, take the veil off my mind. I want to know the thoughts of Jesus. Is that, have you ever done that? How do you think I write sermons? Jesus, show me your deepest thoughts. I want to know you. Is that okay? Just do that. These are good faith practices so you can grow in your calling. Because I don't know you. God does. I don't. I cannot know what God has done for you. All I can do is prepare a people. And so when you call to Jesus, say, Lord, remove any veil, any darkness, something that's disconnecting me from you, I need it gone now. And then all you know is, the scripture says, because when I came to Jesus, you said you would take it off. Now, I'm telling you, that's going to help a lot of people if you would just make that part of your prayer exercise. So let's go back to Revelation 1, verse 1. Let's get rolling. Revelation 1, verse 1 says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave Jesus to show us. So now we're ready. No veil, no lies, no secrets, 
Just God showing God's thought process. Now that's a powerful thing to say. So let's do this. This story begins with John writing how he was on the island of Patmos. Why was he on the island of Patmos? Because they exiled him. They say historically, it's not in the Bible, but have you ever heard of Fox and Book of Martyrs and other stories where they count the apostles? They say they tried to kill John and they couldn't. Because why would you exile a guy? Wouldn't you just kind of cut him? They said they couldn't kill the guy. So they just threw him on an island because he was old at that point. Now that's not in the Bible, so just bear with me. But he's on the island of Patmos because of his witness for God. Because he was speaking boldly of Jesus. And there on the Lord's day, he was in the spirit and he heard a voice and it said this. If you don't mind, let's jump down to John 1, verses 4 through 5. Let's go back a little bit. I jumped ahead. Verse 4 through 5. John writes, he says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. I apologize. I didn't want to leave that out. This is John's formal declaration as he begins to write. John says again, To seven churches which are in Asia, grace and peace to him from him who is and who was and to come, from the seven spirits who before his throne, and from Jesus Christ. You know what John's saying? I'm about to write you a letter that God wrote, not in one picture, not in just a blink, not in an individual prophecy, a book that is founded in what? The fullness of God's presence. Do y'all understand what I just said? John is saying, okay, let me give you another one. You know how they write letters in the Old, uh, Old Testament, the king would say, hey, Claudius, or king this to this king? You know in the Old Testament they would write letters, and they say, Nebuchadnezzar, to you, or to all people. Or when Paul starts the letter, he would say, Paul, the apostle, to this person. John says, God in all his glory, the fullness of the seven spirits of God, the fullness of Jesus, all of them are about to collide and release to you a writing. Does everybody see that? So John is only verifying what I said. The first verse is the revelation of God. Now John says, if God were to appear for you in all three, and the fullness of the Spirit, which is the seven spirits of God. I told you it's complicated. And they were all to come together, and they begin to speak. This is what's going to happen. Y'all ready? I hope you're ready. Now let's continue. I didn't want to miss that, friends. Apologize. So in verse 11, you don't mind jumping down to verse 11. As John was in the spirit, he heard a voice behind him saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and what you see, write in a book, and to send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Let's go jump down, verses 12 through 17. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke of me, John is about to get a picture of this fullness of God. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were, like, were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. And his voice is the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars out of his mouth when a sharp two-edged sword, as countenance was like the sun shining his strength. Stop there for me. You don't mind going back to verse 16. Do you see the description? Was that specific? Was that's pretty specific. Can I just ask you to jog your Bible memory? How often do you read about someone in the Bible meeting God and describing what they saw? Can you think of a few? Is it often? No. This is the last book of the Bible. It's 66 books. There's only a few. Isaiah 6. Isaiah meets Jesus and sees him high on the throne. He describes what he saw. Daniel 7. Daniel sees the Ancient of Days sitting on a throne and there was a rainbow. And he saw the lambs coming next to him. Ezekiel. You remember that? Ezekiel 1. He saw the glory, the four-faced being. And later on, he saw it again at the river Chabar. That's only a few. That's it. You say, well, Moses. Moses never really says, oh, his eyes are this, his hair is this, that. He does not. It just says he spoke to him like a friend. 
That's it. I'm trying to tell you, friends, each one of those sentences was a revelation of God. You're going to understand that. Each one of those sentences was a revelation of God. What was this book called? The Revelation of Jesus. And it says that every sentence had something particular about it. That's hard to understand. Would you mind going to Revelation 2, verse 1? Revelation 2, verse 1. He writes Revelations. What does it say? Who is identifying himself? To Ephesus. These things says him who what? Holds seven stars and walks amongst the seven gold lampstands. Then jump down. Would you mind to verse 8? Verse 8. Revelation 2, verse 8 says this. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, these things says the first and last who is dead and came to life. God addresses each church with what? One characteristic. Keep that in mind. Jump down to verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos, right? These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. Again, just one revelation of Jesus. Would you mind going to Revelation 3 verse... I'm sorry, Revelation 2 verse 18. And to the church of Thyatira, these things says the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. And we'll stop at Revelation 3 verse 1. These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and seven stars. And he continues and talks to the church. Now go back with me for a minute. I want you guys to all understand. Go back to Revelation 1, verses 12 through 17. Let's go fast. Revelation 1, 12 through 17. John hears God talk and says, I heard God. I turn to see the revelation of God. John continued. Go to verse 12. It says, I saw some gold lampstands. Verse 13 says he saw someone like the Son of Man. He begins to describe his physical appearance. Each step has importance. You drop down to verse 14. It will tell you again his head and hair. Verse 15. His clothing. His voice. Verse 16. His countenance. His face like the sun is strength. Now John saw all of the revelation. Each church saw one. What happens to John? Go to verse 17. Now you'll understand. I hope you bring your stand. And when I saw him, what? I fell dead. Do, do you see that? This book is about God, not a man. One man received every revelation of God. And he said, when I saw that, I died. How many revelations does each church get of these seven? What did I show you? One. To Ephesus. This aspect of Jesus, which you just read in Revelation 1. To Smyrna, this one step. And in that one revelation, we're going to study that he begins to say, because of that point, I'm going to address this to you. Do you all understand the book of Revelation? Have you ever read Revelation 2 and 3? If you have not, this might confuse you. But we're going to go slow and study. But I'm just building something to show you. Each church gets how many revelations of Jesus? One. What did John do? see? All of it. But if you saw all of it, what happened to John? Out. What does this church get? That's your choice, isn't it? Isn't it? What we're going to do is we're going to study what Jesus said to everybody. I told you we're going to study the seven spirits of God. And I told you it would be very challenging and very complex because at that time, Jesus said right to each church. It was John writing or Jesus? Really, Jesus. John was just told, write down what you hear. Jesus is the one writing. And each church gets to see what aspect. Hey, I'm the guy with the sword. Hey, I'm the guy that did, died and lived for more. I'm the guy with the eyes like flame of fire. I'm the one whose feet are refined in fire. And because of that, this is what I see in your church. And this is what I see in your church. But John got to see everything. And that was too much for a man. And I'll tell you, friends. Anybody... If you read the scripture, they got a picture of God in his fullness had one reaction. The holiness of God is going to kill him. Did you catch that? 
When any man in Scripture begins to say, I am going to seek God in his terrain, up to now, many of us have only had God come down out of heaven and say, okay, Jesus, thank you for coming down from earth. Thank you for becoming a man. Thank you for absorbing my sin and dying on a cross. Once you're saved and you begin to serve God, you say, you know what, Lord? I want to be more like you and I have more of an ascension. And I see more of God's vision. And like John, I'm beginning to hear more about Jesus. And Jesus, oh, you want to know about me? Each church gets one. I believe that God has called us to study these seven, not just to say what's wrong with church. I'm going to show you just a deeper picture of Jesus. And that takes a lot of soul searching. If you're familiar with Revelations 2 and 3, it's not exactly the most polite words. So here's my choice for this church. You can read these things together, and you can listen to my words, and you can respond, and you're going to begin to see more of the Spirit of God than you've ever seen in your life. You can trust me on this. Or, you can pass my words, and you can say, nah, that's not for me. And still probably it won't offend me. I'm not going to read these chapters and begin to assault anybody, but I'm telling you, when this book is called the Revelation of God, that's what it means. And it's given in this picture, John sees a description. And on one of the only times of the Bible, he said, I saw this, I saw this, I saw that, I saw this. And each picture, each step, has significance. And each church gets to hear one of them. We have the entire scriptures for us. I believe, as God has told me for years, it's not a matter of hammering God in prayer saying, why? God gives me one answer. You read it again. Every time, God's like, you reread your Bible and you'll find the answer you've been asking me for. I can tell you very clearly that God has asked me to study these things more times than I can count. But every time I study again, I say, you know what? I don't think I really knew that the first time go around. Is that okay? I hope everybody's clear on what we're going to do. Because, friends, I'm going to give you a word, and it's going to be ugly. But to open up Revelations 2 and 3, I'm going to give you one word. Polarization. That's a big word. Polarization. You say, what does that mean? You ever had polarized sunglasses? Do you know what polarized does? It just breaks light down into one way. This way or this way. It just breaks light down in stripes. If you want to use polarize in a social conversation, you know what it does? It just removes the gray. What Jesus is going to do with this church is get rid of all the wiggle room. Do you know what I mean by gray? It's either white or black, friends. It's either on and off. There's no neutral with Jesus. As you begin to study Revelations 2 and 3, Jesus says you're either with me or you're what? You're against me. That's called polarized. When Jesus sees the church and begins to speak out of the Spirit of God, he's going to put it in one way. You've got two choices. It's either me or not me. Again, I'm going to go back to my previous just plea, just not threatening people. When it comes to seeking God's Spirit and saying, I want to have those seven. I want to know what it is to reveal things the way God reveals I want to operate. When we say spiritual growth, okay, we have to grow, we have to increase, we have to learn scripture, we have to pray, and then we get baptized, and we get filled. And Jesus said, I was filled with the fullness of God. And you say, well, I'd like to do that too. I'd like to do that too. He said, yes, yes. Come, come, all you would desire. Come close to Jesus. And Jesus says, you're coming into the holiness of God. In the realm of God's holiness, there's no gray. There's no, well, I think it's okay. It's okay if I do this, it's okay with that. If you want to spend time with Christ at this level, it's either all on. Do it. It's okay. And to do that, let's go to Revelations chapter 2. Verses 1 through 7. Revelations 2, chapter, Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Jesus is talking. John's writing. Jesus is talking. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, right? These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of seven golden stands, golden lampstands. Let's just hold that thought. Who's talking? Jesus, right? He's talking about himself. Did John see that picture? Yes. This church only gets to hear that one point. Now, what does that mean? Go to verse 2. Now, let's understand that revelation. He says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. 
And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. Verse 3. And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember therefore where you have fallen, repent, and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. We'll stop at verse 6. But this you have, that you hate the deed of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Friends, I understand that that is not the most friendly scripture. But can I tell you something very plainly? He starts with this church for a reason. You're going to find as we go from church to church to church, there is a deliberate order. So as a church, I'm not calling anybody out. I'm not picking on one person nor anybody. I believe this Bible teaches us that God had no problem addressing the church. That's okay. I'm willing to put us on the line. I'm willing to put our church on the line against any church on the line in this history. Because if I'm afraid of that, then I don't know what I'm in this for. If I have a mindset that this church should be in the shadows of another church, or maybe we can get behind somebody else leading the charge, I don't know what I'm doing here. I feel like if we come up to Jesus and he says, you come together. Where do you stand? I say, Jesus, we've talked about this. I am very familiar with your address to this church and the other six. And we've dealt with it. So again, this requires us, not me. Us. I hope you don't take that in any other derogatory firm other than when we look at Christ. Now let's go back to verse 4. And let's just get to the heart of the matter. What's the issue? Verse 4 says this. Jesus says, I have something against you that you left your first love. So let's talk about that. Just a minute. Let's just kind of put our, our pencils down. Let's put our guard down. Let's just talk about that for a minute. What does he mean, I have an issue with you, and I believe that that is not as bad as it sounds until you understand his perspective? What was his perspective? If you go back to verse 1, he said what? I am the one that holds the seven stars, and I walk amongst the lampstands. Now, if something doesn't make any sense, would you mind going to Revelation 1, verse 20? That's the last verse of Revelation 1. Now, keep in mind, do you know that day and age there weren't really chapter numbers? Have you ever written an email and started putting chapters in the email? That's a joke, friends. I don't think any of us do. I don't, I mean, if you write me and you have chapter numbers, I'm going to be a little worried and going to look at that little length of box and be like, dude, how long is this email? Or sometimes people send me a dream, and that's when it gets haywire. But it's okay. Verse 20, which had been the previous sentence to this explanation. He explains, he says, The mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars of the angel of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands, which you saw, saw are the seven churches. Now go back to Revelation 2, verse 1. He says, in verse 1, I am the guy that walks in the midst of what? I walk this church. Do you know that? Jesus walks this church. You can Michael, you're talking about seven. No, friends. I'm telling you very clearly. Jesus has walked this church. Let's not lie to yourselves. Don't be like, oh, okay, I've got to read my book report and get up to date on Michael and this church and what's going on. He doesn't need an update. His spirit's here. His presence is with you. And so when he says, I'm among you, as you come to fellowship, I believe when he speaks, he says, it's not just because I heard gossip. It's not because I, well, I saw that you weren't so happy. He's saying, I'm actually here. I, I know what's going on. I don't need to talk to Michael. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to the church. So what does he say? He says, guys, some of us have left our first love. Now, friends, I'll just speak very casually for a moment. If you've ever been in a relationship, when you first begin to pursue a relationship, you know on your phone you've got that speed dial that's like your girl or something like that? Okay, whatever. You guys are all too holy for me. <laughs> and then, you know, you text her to her. She has like 450 texts, or back in my day it was email. So that would have been all the emails or something like that. And, you, you know, if she sent an email, you would have heard on it like that. Whatever was happening, you would have stopped and read it. Absolutely. You got a phone call, you would have stopped what was happening. Anything that she did would have become the priority. Now, we can all act tough. That's fine. I don't mind just being honest for a minute. But then time goes on. 
and time slows in and things slow down and things become a little more, you know, just comfortable. And then they become common and they become taken for granted. And then when she calls, you say, as my wife here sometimes, I'm very busy. I'm very busy right now. I really am. But I'm really busy. And she'll joke, she'll say, hey, you know my husband, his name is busy. So it, it's just kind of this thing that happens. And I'm not defending everything in myself. I always have room to grow. But that's what happens. And so you should remember, how does Jesus see his church? What is it called? It starts with a B. Come on, guys. Y'all should know this, huh? It's bride. Thank you. There was way too much quietness in that answer. The bride of Christ, the bride is the church. The bride. We're this bride. And you as well I know that when you've been in a relationship and you first pursue it, you start hammering your phone, you're all over Facebook, like, who's that guy next to her? And then you find that's her brother or cousin, you're like, oh, I probably shouldn't have said anything. How do I delete that email? You're not catching this stuff. Come on, friends. My issue is this. You're all over it. And you're monitoring and you're checking. You're like, you weren't here at 7.02. We said we'd call 7 o'clock. That's two minutes late. 120 seconds. You know, and then things slow down. What does Jesus feel? If Jesus says, you lost your first love, what's he insinuating? Do y'all remember when you first came to Jesus? Do y'all remember that moment? I can, I can spell it out in a book for you. I remember when I had absolutely nothing to offer to God except a broken, miserable man. Nothing. But you know what happens? You know what happens when these Christians grow up? They become teenagers. And they start talking back to God like this. And they start telling God what I've done for you. And you owe me. And I've done this for you. You know what it looks like to God? Like a teenager spending his dad's credit card comes home and says, Hey, Dad, I took care of all that. And Dad's like, Dude, dude the, the shirt you're wearing, that's mine. Like the shoes... <laughs> The bed, the food, the electricity, AC, all that's mine. Why are you talking like that to me? That's kind of how I feel when God talks about this scripture. Like, I found you dead, and you're telling me how things work. Okay. I told you, it's polarizing. It's either you're here or here. God adopted you as his son, as his daughter. There is no, like, hey, here's how it's going to work, God. It's more like, Sir, yes, sir. It's not any other. In all fairness, if you've lost your first love, then something else has become what? Your first love. Is that fair? If Jesus says you have left your first love, that's Revelation 2 verse 4, if you want to just put it up on the screen. If Jesus says <clears throat> you have left your first love, then clearly what's your first love? Something else. And my friends, again, I'm going to say this Lovingly, you know, as well as I do, that our free time isn't always as devoted to God as it was, just as our free time isn't always as devoted to our other half as it was in the beginning. Does that make sense? So if I have a girlfriend or a wife or something, and we begin talking, and things are like, oh, 24 hours a day, we're talking, and then slowly the gas backs off, you're on the brakes, it slows down. And so, friends, what Jesus is really saying is, am I still first in your book? Am I still first in your thought process? Am I still the first person in your day? Am I still the first person in your, in your daytime morning routine? Or the first person when you sit down to eat? Am I the first person when you get home from work? Am I really the first person you call? Because somebody else is. And Jesus says, I walk your halls. And I know when you have other things going on. So he says... You don't see me as number one. And so, I don't like that. So, like, look, is he talking to unbelievers? Is he talking about the, 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 the other religion outside, the, the, the temple down the road? No. He's talking to us because we're his bride. And being his bride, we need to understand what it means to say, Jesus, it's time for us to repent. Verse 5. And go back to when I first met you. Okay. Now, if you do that, I believe you will find yourself rejoicing in the joy of your salvation once again. Some of us have found ourselves in dire straits. Some of ourselves found ourselves a little frustrated. But I would ask you this. Is Jesus number one in your life? Every day of the week. If not, Jesus says, 
I'm the guy that holds the seven stars and I have seven life scans. I know you better than you know you. So if I say you're not really loving me the way you're supposed to, I have a right to. That's all Jesus is saying. And believe me, as we begin to pursue the seven spirits of God, you're going to find out that this is critical to God. And to give you that answer, would you mind going to 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3? 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1 through 3. And I promise you, you're going to get your eyes open with Revelation. Watch this. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1 through 3. It is going to answer everything you read in Revelation chapter 2. Paul says, Though I speak with the gifts and power and all these things, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am just a bunch of noise. Verse 2. Though I prophesy, and, I, and though I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, and though I can remove mountains, if I don't love, I am what? Nothing. Verse 3. Even if I give everything I have to the poor, and I'm going to die a martyr. If I don't love, it has done what? Nothing. Now that list there, was that worldly things? Or what would you call that ministry? Right. Gifts, prophecy, tongues, faith that moves mountains, generosity, man, it's there, generosity is out there. Those aren't things of the world, friends. He's talking to ministers. He's talking to a church. He's talking to us. And he said, if you don't really know what it is to love, don't talk to me about the power of God and all oh, the anointing and the filling of the Holy Ghost and all these things. What did Jesus tell us? This? If you don't love God first, you're in danger. And Paul says, if you don't know what it is to love, then clearly you're wasting your time. You're wasting your time. It's hard to love people, I'll be honest. It's hard to love people. People have a funny way of doing things to you when you're doing everything you can. Friends, if you're desiring to serve God publicly in a ministry, can I just warn you? It ain't always just, you know, stars and stripes and just blue bonnet fields and just, like, joy and doing, you know, hula hoop dancing. It's not that. It's going to be loving people when they kind of like, God, spit on your face. But Jesus says, do you love me first? Because if I love Jesus first, that's all that's going to carry me. If I'm leaning on people's rewards, if I'm leaning on people's response, if I lean on people's reactions to me, it won't carry me. I've got to love God first. When I tell you about the seven spirits of God, friends, I'm telling you very boldly, you have to love God first. You're wasting your time. You want to go down a road that brings you to the very holy place of God? And you don't love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? You, this is a waste. You won't make it. So Paul says, you want to see prophecy, you want to see the power of God. If you don't love, eh, what's it good for? So let's go to verse 4 through 7, if you don't mind. It says this. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. Verse 5. Love does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So often people read that scripture for marriages, and it's a great verse. But whose love is it really talking about? God's love. Only God's love could be at that extreme. No arrogance. No pride, no self-serving, no backbiting, no fakeness, no doubt. It believes all things, it hopes all things. Because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes on him may have eternal life and not perish. It sounds like God believed that there was a value in finding unity through his own son's sacrifice. That I believe is the love of God. I believe that for us to continue to go into the book of Revelations, one thing's going to carry you and me. Not our perceived wisdom. Not all this knowledge like a teenager that becomes smart in school and starts telling his dad, you know, you're dumb. I, I know calculus. Dad's like, so what? Is that going to pay electricity bill? It doesn't mean anything. If you just tell dad, I love you, you can bet dad will say, man, that's all I want to hear. 
After all the long day, after all the things I've thrown through, if my son meets me at the door and says, Dad, I love you, I can bet you. Whatever else doesn't even matter. You want to hear? Whatever happens is not going to matter. But do you mind just jumping down to the last verse? Verse 13 in Corinthians 13. It says, now abide. It says, don't quit. Now abide in faith. Abide in hope. Abide in love. But the greatest thing that Ephesus and we need to hear is love. If you don't love God first, if you don't know what it is to love the brethren, that's all we need. Would you mind jumping back to Revelation 2? We're going to stop here. Revelation 2, verse 7. At the end of that letter to Ephesus, he says this. Revelation 2, verse 7, he says what? If you will hear me, hear me. Did you catch that? Jesus says, you don't have to hear me. But if you have an ear for the Spirit, if you want to know revelation of God's full seven spirits, what does it say? Hear what the Spirit says. Did you catch that? Who told Jesus? Where did the revelation come from? Did you catch that? Look carefully, friends. Who's giving the revelation? The Holy Spirit. What did I say there were? Seven. Seven. Seven spirits of God. And Jesus says, if you can listen to the Spirit of God, you will receive something. And to him overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. We talked about eating just two weeks ago. I don't find these things accidents. I don't find these things as accidents. I believe that God is showing us what it is to have things that people have not see in ears. Would you mind standing?